so today we have for you a little bit of a time sensitive channel exclusive. I wonder where we could be going. So we find ourselves back at Western Approaches Command again. So why are we here you might ask, apart from the fact it's a very nice place to be. Well this is a little bit of an exclusive because you might notice we are in fact in the map room, but the map behind me is no longer the black that we saw last time. It is in fact a shade of green and it has some rather interesting lines on it. So why is this changed? Why is this important? And how interesting is it to us naval enthusiasts? Well, let's find out. So we're here once again with the museum's director. So if you'd just like to let everybody know who you are, just in case there are a few people out there who may not have seen the yeah, previous uh, video. I am uh, Dean Patton. I'm the founder and director of Big Heritage, who are the custodians of Western Approaches. Cool. And now we're looking at this map. Um, as we said, it is a, a, a nice green color now, and it's all looking a bit different. The contours of the coastline are looking somewhat sharper and more defined. So what's happened? Is it just a, a repaint, or uh, is there some historical backing to this? Rather, rather large uh, bit, of, bit of refurbishment. So just a little bit of background. At the end of the Second World War, the map was taken down, um, ripped off. We do know from one of the, the men who was working in the team who were engineers, they sold it, it was, bit, it was um, cork backed and they sold the cork for bathroom floors. Um, so in 1990, when the building was rediscovered and reopened, they had a bit of a pastiche of a map. And in, in, in fact, the first phase was paper maps. And then about a year after opening, about 91, 92, a film company came in, wanted to use the room for a film which has never been released um, because we don't know who, who the film company were, but they painted a, a map on the wall, which was roughly what, uh, you know, the, the, the North Atlantic, um, but it was, it was of, of a poor quality. It was black because on the black and white photos, the map was black, um, which meant when we took over, we, we, we understood one of the, the, the big restoration works was to put this map, which is the centerpiece of the building, back into, uh, in, into its original form. So this is uh, the, the culmination, the last few days of an incredibly long an arduous piece of work during lockdown to get this map as it was. So, and how did we find out what this map actually looked like at the time? Well, we have photographic evidence which helps us uh, to an extent of what the map looked like, but we know that they also, uh, the map changes at least twice from, from the start of the war to the end of the war. Um, so first of all, we have to choose a, a time period, if you like, which we wanted to, to represent. We have testimonies from Wrens who worked here, or histories and, and, and Wrens who visited, who said, Actually, the map was dark green, and uh, the land masses were, were this kind of buff beige colour. So we, we understood that in the 90s they looked at a black and white photo and not recognised that the dark green also uh, appears as, as black. Um, then by by quirk and fortune, a slightly kind of misarchived um, set of documents have appeared, which were uh, signed off by uh, Dunbar Nate Smith who, uh, writing from Plymouth at the time in 1941, was given the final touches, if you like, on what they wanted up at Western Approaches uh, Command, which were quite detailed, so we went down to the shade of colour of the map, the coordinate system, why they were going to show certain things, there were the layout of the room, which has actually changed slightly and, and they never went ahead with. So we had this bit of gold dust as well to allow us to um, accurately put it put it back it's been it's been hand, hand painted it's been done um, using traditional methods and tools there's no you know there's no printing there's no, no digital involvement so this is as good as, as, as what the map would have looked like in mm -hmm. its height of operation and given that in the early part of the 20th century in the uk there seemed to be a love of dark green colors what particular shade is this <laughs> according to dunbar Smith, it was obsidian green and buff for the land colour, they did also uh, say that they wanted the land masses to be outlined in red, but we've got no, uh, not on none of the photos, photos this, this hasn't happened, there's no, there's no darker line, and, and there are lots of changes that were, were missed off, so we've kept with the dark green and the, uh, and, and the buff uh, paint colour, um, so we were, we were helped very handily by, by brewers who are a, 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 a national and they're very old actually, much older than this building paint company and uh, they helped kind of colour match the, the paint and then was uh, so enamoured with the project that they actually gave us the paint for free, uh, mm -hmm. which also helped. Uh, and we also had a, 
a very um, surprising ally from, from the United States who helped us as well. Okay, cool. And I noticed compared to the map last time we were here, we've got these dotted lines surrounding some of the land masses. So presumably this is some kind of shallow or sandbank marked yeah. area. So we have, um, again, this is um, not just off the documents, but just pouring over the photographs that are available. Um, the, the dotted coordinates are every five degrees, it's a counter system, and then sandbanks are, are, are marked in, so it's an admiralty chart effectively, so everything, all the detail you'd expect on a North Atlantic admiralty chart, they had up on the wall, and uh, it was only by really kind of looking at, you know, through, through almost microscopes we could, we could pick out the detail. The last finishing touches are um, the names of some of the islands and some of the sandbanks to go on. And then the bigger challenge was getting the scale right because obviously this map is too perfect scale. You can pretty much navigate with this map, but the map scale changes halfway because we have another another map further across, which is just getting finished, which is at a different scale, which shows uh, the western part of the Mediterranean. So um, it's been one hell of a, a challenge and very painful on the brain to get it right, but we were exceedingly proud of, <laughs> of, of what it looks like so far. And we've we've got this this grid coordinate system, obviously. Uh, based on presumably... This is long, Latin long, mm, yeah. so um, each one of these is a, a degree of latitude and longitude with five, uh, the dotted lines at every five degrees. The numbers go up along the size of the continent, they're not all quite finished mm -hmm. yet, but obviously from a practical sense when you're working at IT, you don't want to have to step back to have a look at things, so we're finding out more about the operation of Western approaches through the technical difficulties of restoring this wall of how they must have done it and how it must have worked so not only is it a restoration project but we've, we've learned a lot from the mm -hmm. building as well and some of the photos that we were looking at earlier uh, which hopefully will be coming up on the screen at the moment also show what looks to be like a gigantic steering wheel placed at various points on this map when it was in live use so what's the story behind those so we weren't too sure ourselves at first we've obviously seen the photographs for the last couple of years and what we've discovered now is that they were actually um 150 mile radius no bomb areas which were for uh, allied bombers um, which basically indicated the positions or, or you know, general position of Allied submarines, both uh, both sides of the Atlantic. So these were to obviously update the, the RAF or the US Air Force of let's not bomb these areas. Yeah. Well, we might, maybe not tell you why, but these these are uh, currently out of bounds. Okay, cool. So now that this is all all going up, this will hopefully all be in place for reopening on the first of August. We reopen the. Uh, uh, on Saturday, um, we have a coronavirus restrictions and everything in place. We're a one-way route system. As you go around, it's all uh, you don't really pass with anyone else. So we've rechanged the route, so we, we, we should be safe. And uh, uh, as someone's mentioned before, that the uh, if the Luftwaffe didn't manage to close us down, then coronavirus is certainly not going to either. Now, the documents mentioned in that section are actually very interesting. For example, this letter, dated 10th of April 1941, from Admiral Dunbar Naismith, goes into fair degree of detail as to exactly what he wants worked out. Also of interest, you'll see it's called Moat Headquarters, that's M-O-A-T, and it's referred to that twice. Now, this is almost certainly some sort of cover name, and I think it might stand for Ministry of Aircraft Transport, but not entirely sure. So if anybody has any other ideas as to an, an acronym of Moat in British service in 1941 that they could be using as a cover for Western Approaches Command Construction, do let us know in the comments below. Now here are some of those notes that were taken during the setup of Western Approaches Command. You can see almost nothing was left to chance, with even such things as a moon board being installed, which would allow them to work out things like the rise and fall of the tides, as well as obviously indicating the kind of visibility that might exist at night, which would either aid or hinder U-boat operations and vice versa for the escorts depending on how much light was available. Now interestingly as you can see from the two pictures that will be accompanying this particular bit of narration there were actually plans to have that giant map on the wall divided into two equal halves. This was never actually done as the earliest records from the bunker itself show that the large map of the Atlantic was always there in some way shape or form with smaller maps off to one side but it is interesting to note what they were thinking. You can see on the first one there's a note that says the navy map continues on the east wall to show the rest of the British Isles to the east. 
Now, bearing in mind that this was a joint forces command, you can surmise, also from the label to be honest, that the other half would have been an RAF map. So if we go over to the second image, you can see how this would have been arranged with platforms and screens dividing the two maps, and all the Navy personnel off on one side with their desks, and all the RAF personnel off on the other side with their desks. The only surviving remnant of this particular plan that actually made it to fruition were the two operating offices, which we saw in our previous video on Western Approaches Command, and which you can see marked out here at the lower section of the screen. And Admiral Dunbar Naismith was clearly convinced that victory was to be found in the details, because not only was there the plans that we've just seen laying out how the main command and control room would work, but the notes even go as far as to detail exactly what kind of symbol should be used. Now you can see in the next two screens that we're going to be showing, these covered all sorts of things. There were different symbols for convoys, aircraft, individual ships, arrows for direction, and then individual shapes for different kinds of ships, battle cruisers, merchant vessels, small convoys, aircraft carriers, cruisers, armed merchant vessels, battleships, destroyers, escort vessels, airstrike forces, submarines, numbers, in case you needed to denote that there was more than one of a particular type. There was even a particular symbol for a pocket battleship, i.e. the Deutschland class heavy cruisers of the Kriegsmarine, as well as numbers of merchant ships and them moving in directions, question marks to indicate an unknown German force, minesweepers, and various coordinates. And as you can see, all of this was detailed in precise coloration, and even had dimensions given. You can also see on the top left of the first slide the various prefixes for the Atlantic convoys. Now what were they made of? Well, just above that you can see it says symbols for the RAF and Navy, made of celluloid of various thicknesses, colours to be pressed into the celluloid by Chad Valley Corporation. And just in case you were wondering whether or not the coloration of the various symbols was random or denoted something very specific, you can see that there have been notes made on the second slide. Own forces were red in the middle and white. Enemy forces were black with white. Enemy forces that were forecast for the following day were to be white and black. Neutral forces would be yellow and white. There's also a note at the top that indicates that the various Navy ship symbols would have different colours of different types, but that would be supplied later. Unfortunately, the document doesn't say exactly what those colours were in detail, but as you can see in the various symbology references, some of the initial colours had been worked out. Also, at the bottom right there, there's even specific instructions as to where to put the pins and rivets. So there was an awful lot of fine detail planning going into this. And whilst all this does tell us just how fanatically detailed Admiral Dunbar Naismith's commission for Western Approaches Command was going to be, it's also an incredibly useful resource for another reason. Because when it comes to putting all this back together, those notes are incredibly valuable for coming up with something that looks precisely the same as it did back in the 1940s. Now the symbology would go on to evolve beyond these brief pages, with markers for wind direction and speed, as well as ships sunk and specific types of aircraft rather than just generic enemy aircraft. What did all those look like, you might wonder? Well, here's a small selection of originals taken from the bunker back when it was in use in the Second World War. Now you won't recall seeing these on our previous video about Western Approaches Command, and indeed this is what, yes, another one of these things that has only just come to light. These, as we said, are full-on originals, and they were just taken home one day by one of the Wrens who worked there, and not brought back. And then eventually, many many years down the line, her family have passed them back to Western Approaches Command, so not only do we have specific examples of some of these symbols and how they're used, we know that these were actually up on the board at some point. That red cross there on the left, for instance, denotes a sunken ship. But that's not all that's changed in the last few months since the footage for the first video was recorded. So last time we were in this room, it looked a little bit of a state, having only just been opened up. 
were commenting on some of the original colour scheme and how that differed from what occurred in the intervening period in the 90s. But as you might notice now, it's looking a little bit brighter, a little bit more switched on, and there's a lot more machinery around here. So how exactly has all this come to pass? So as we were saying, last time we were here, it was pretty much just discovered. So what's happened? Um, so it was another opportunity again with, with lockdown to do a bit of, of construction work. It was boarded up, so we've, uh, the wall's been ripped, ripped down, and given the state it was in, we do have a policy to try and keep everything as it was, rather than making everything pristine. How long has been left, you know, left for a bit of dust and a bit of smell helps with the, with the atmosphere. But we took the decision to completely restore this room. Again, we took paint scrapings, got the exact paint colour code, and we completely restored the room back as it was. So it was a, a, an RAF. Um, wireless telegraphy room. Um, the original desk stations are now uh, back in place, even to the fact that we've rewired each one of these would have had an individual desk and a teleprinter on. And we were blessed with a collection of teleprinters when uh, we arrived that were, were, were boarded and locked away and we've restored uh, pretty much all of them that are here now back to uh, clattering working order. So um, back into the original positions and uh, safely, safely wired. Uh, but it, I mean, what it does is it, it gives visitors the one opportunity in the building to see what it would have been like pristine, you know, when, when it was in operation, it was made new from scratch. So it would have been like this so without taking away that kind of the ambiance of the place. It gives us a, a different kind of a feel of, of what the room would have been like to have worked in. Yeah. And when we were when it was all being refitted, um, again, hopefully appearing on screen now, there'll be a picture of some of the random bits and pieces that were found literally down the back of the cupboards. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, that delayed the work project because everyone was so obsessed with looking what we could find. So we cleared out what are radiator guards, they're like guards to stop people burning their legs on the, ra the radiators underneath. And we just found this mini treasure trove of junk that people had left from, from, the, from the war, from sweet wrappers and sandwich wrappers through to more interesting items such as um, Navy kind of communication sheets, which would have obviously come straight through into this room. Uh, a, a monograph lighter with someone's initials on, um, hair combs, um, just other little bits and pieces. But um, for, for us, it's kind of a bit of social history. It's a reminder that these are people doing their, their job here. And, and like us, they, they probably drop sweet wrappers down the side of the thing as everything else. And it's, uh, so as, as much as this place is about tactics and the grand picture of the Battle of the Atlantic, it's uh, stuff like that, which brings it home into a, a real place for people, real people lived and worked. And for those of you who are watching very closely or have large screens, you'll see that there's a few lines of code, apparently, on that code sheet. So if you happen to be a budding code breaker or you know something about World War II Navy codes, it might mean something. If you do, let, and if you do know, let us know in the comments and we'll see what it says. It may just be nonsense, it but who be knows? It a sandwich order, but um, mm. who knows? Now, of course, work to Western Approaches Command is ongoing and will be ongoing once they've reopened. So obviously this is Admiral Horton's office, as was seen in the previous video, but there are a number of other areas that still require renovation. The old accommodation block is still under renovation and work. There's a whole section behind the map room, specifically behind the giant map, which is also having work done to it, and part of the plan is to turn that section into a wren museum. And no, that's not to commemorate the small birds that live in hedges, although they probably deserve a museum of their own. This is for the Women's Royal Naval Service, or WRNS, abbreviated to wrens because it's easy to pronounce. So hopefully at some point in the future that will get done as well. And of course, all the other good stuff we saw in the previous video, all the other rooms nice, neatly labelled up and described, are already there. There are also longer range plans to provide a walking audio tour, and who knows, that might even start yours truly. As well as trying to further expand the space devoted to the WATU, the Western Approaches Tactical Unit, and their wargaming section. Now obviously as compared to the rest of the bunker which can be restored like for like to the way it was in the 1940s, Watu unfortunately can't be because it was of course based on the upper floors which are now in use for completely different purposes and have been extensively renovated since and I don't think the companies that own those floors A would like us to kick them out or B would appreciate us ripping out all the modern fixtures and fittings and putting it back to the old 1940s layout.
which of course means that some space is going to have to be found to accommodate that particular set of displays. Now of course there is one thing that any good Watu display will require, given that it was large scale tactical wargaming with small model pieces. So yes, of course, there will be a need for some small model pieces, both for the Watu display and also to try and give people a better idea of what a convoy was actually like. And this is actually where you viewers watching this video have actually managed to come in and help a bit. Because of course, by watching these videos, you allow the channel to generate revenue, and that revenue goes into purchasing things like this little collection, getting them painted up to a decent standard, and then of course, donated to Western Approaches Command. So yes, this little convoy fragment that you can see here, a freighter that's come a bit of a cropper, as well as a tanker and another freighter, a flower class corvette, an armed trawler, and a type 7 that's having a particularly bad day of things, will at some point hopefully find their way onto display somewhere in Western Approaches Command. So if you happen to be in the area at some point and you see those, well, there you go, you now know where they came from. But of course, preserving history, especially in the current circumstances, is no easy task, and certainly not one that's easy to do alone. Everyone has to chip in where they can, in whatever way, shape or form they can, whether that be directly or whether that be indirectly by visiting, by providing letters and word of support, be it just spreading the word that the museum exists and encouraging other people to go, or providing information that they can use in their various displays, or just knowing other people with skills that could be contributed, such as the, the rather excellent commission painter who painted up those ships for me. And so in that spirit, we're going to round out this video with a section talking about some other people who have proven to be exceptionally helpful to Western Approaches Command in a number of ways. So we're up here in Admiral Horton's office to discuss one last element of this. Now, obviously restoring a bunker like this is not cheap uh, or easy. So we understand there's some friends who've helped out with this. Yeah, um, we've uh, had some American friends who, who've come in and, and, and give us some support. So. Uh, earlier on this year, we had a visitor from the United States Ambassador, Woody Johnson, um, who was particularly enamored with the place, given uh, the history of his, his own mother, Betty Johnson, um, who sadly passed away earlier this year. She was in the Wades, which uh, is, is American equivalent of women volunteer, maybe of the Wrens, so there was a, a clear link for him to what his mother was doing during the war. Um, and one, one of the things we'd obviously mentioned was the restoration work. So. Um, four fifths of you like of the actual cost of this restoration work has been uh, donated by the, the the Johnson Foundation in America in memory of uh, the late Betty Johnson. So we, it's um, timely for us uh, to get that help, but actually quite quite an apt kind of donation to be made in, in memory of a, of a lady who was actually training fighter pilots on the other side of the Atlantic um, in and in and in kind of fighter pilot tactics on the same side as our our, our ladies of Renzi were. The, Training naval captains in anti-submarine tactics, anti-U-boat tactics here. So, um, so you know, a big thanks to the Johnson Foundation for, for helping and supporting this project. So Admiral King might not have wanted the, the US Navy's officers to come here and train, but we know that they did anyway in their off time. And it's good to see those transatlantic ties remain strong to this day. Absolutely. I and mean, it's a transatlantic story. And, you know, uh, the, the, the Atlantic arena was very much fought on both sides. They obviously. Um, if you watch the film Greyhound, perhaps you <laughs> might not think there was as much British involvement as there was. We obviously we beg to differ. Um, so, but it's it's nice to see that that story of, of Western approaches is is recognised and acknowledged and and, and, and understood at, 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 on both sides of the yeah. Atlantic. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for granting us access to the bunker once again. Um, so this is a bit of an exclusive because we can actually literally see them still finishing the map as we speak. So. For those of you who may be based in the UK or traveling through the UK in the uh, immediate future, Western Approaches Command reopens 1st of August 2020 at 10 o'clock. So make sure you come on down if you can, if you happen to be in the area or make a small diversion and come and have a look at all the shiny new stuff. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.